Someone called him an anti-China congressman. Laughingly, he responds, nobody is more pro-China than myself. Well, I think that if, as, if I was Secretary of State, uh, any type of uh, trip that I would have to Beijing, I would also make sure that I visited political prisoners and visited uh, the Falun Gong and other people who were struggling. In Congress, congressional members receive lobbyists from all kinds of interest groups. He, however, is not of interest to them. These companies have gone overseas. They put our own people out of work. They have bolstered the strength and the wealth creation that has been co-opted by crony capitalism in China and elsewhere. And we must make sure that the people of the world know that this does not reflect what the American people are all about. He does not mince words that the United States should lead the world, even if it means the U.S. needs to fight alone. No, America should stand tall, and if it has to, stand alone in making sure that we mobilize the good people of the world against the evils of the world. Having served almost three decades in Congress, elected into office for 14 consecutive times, ranking top 24 of the 435 congressional members, he has never assumed any top position in Congress. He cannot visit China, neither is he backed by any special interest group. Precisely for these reasons, people are intrigued to know his preference of America's path to the future. Congressional Representative Dana Rohrabacher was once a special assistant and speechwriter for President Reagan. He helped formulate the Reagan Doctrine and worked for President Reagan for a total of seven years. Of all the Republican congressional members, Rohrabacher was among the first to support Mr. Trump in his presidential bid. In October 2016, when the Republican leaders tried to back away from Trump, Rohrabacher called their move cowardly. He also said, we don't have to just be concerned about saving house seats. We have to be concerned about saving the United States of America. Rohrabacher's insistence on putting America first could be part of the reason he's under consideration for the position of Secretary of State. In my earlier interview with him, he talked about the role U.S. should play in the world, the future path U.S. should embark on, and U.S.-China relations. To me, whether people accept his viewpoints or not, Rohrabacher is definitely rare in today's world, as he predicates his political ideals and practice on nothing but values he holds dear. If becoming Secretary of State, he will be the one that puts America's core values first. Perhaps that's also what America needs the most. Let's meet Congressman Dana Rohrabacher. Congressman Rohrabacher, thank you so much for accepting my interview. Well, actually, it's my way of talking to a lot of people I wouldn't get a chance to uh, talk to otherwise, so thank you. Thank you. So my first question, the United States of America is the most powerful country on this planet. Uh, we call it free world. But different administrations have uh, interpreted this role differently. During the Obama administration, uh, the role is interpreted more like uh, working with more with uh, international communities and leading from behind. So my question is, um, how do you perceive the role of America in this world? Well, first and foremost, America has to be an example to others of a country that stands for principles and freedom and things that relate directly to ordinary people and their lives throughout the world in a positive way. And we are not, should not be on the side of every gangster and dictator, and we should not keep quiet when gangsters and dictators throughout the world are oppressing and murdering their own people. So what should uh, America be all about? And, uh, and yes, uh, Obama wanted to lead from behind. He wanted to be part of international organizations. No, America should stand tall and if it has to, stand alone in making sure that we mobilize the good people of the world against the evils of the world. So you said America should be the example. Do you think America should still lead? And if so, how should America lead? 
Well, for example, when uh, we should set the standards of what we consider to be acceptable uh, behavior on the part of another government towards its own people. And that doesn't mean we should be overthrowing that government. We, uh, unfortunately, there's too many people they, who are interventionists and want America to intervene everywhere in the world. But what we must do is make sure that we are projecting our support, projecting a sense where we are backing people, although we are not personally going to send our troops in to do the job for local people. We have to make sure that when people in Iran, for example, or in China or elsewhere, who are suffering under oppressive regimes, no, we can't go in and do the job for them. But those people need to know, and their oppressors need to know, the American people side with those people who want a freer society and a more peaceful world. That's very easy when, when those leaders seek our leadership to, to some way sanction them, give them some sort of acceptance. We should not be doing that. And we should make sure that if we're meeting with uh, the president of, uh, of China or one of the Mullah regime's people in Iran, that at the end of that meeting that the world knows that we read them the riot act about human rights in their country. You talked about China. Um, I remember in one of your speeches, you said the big American enterprises do not represent the fundamental American values anymore. And uh, we see probably the same big enterprises from America. They are the big players in the engagement policy with China. Right. Decades later, China is not becoming freer or more democratic. And then we, we see this money poured into China has made China developed, but in the way that it has influence over America. So. Uh, in a bad way, probably. So my question is, why do you think the engagement policy failed? Well, we have to make sure that we, uh, uh, that our big major corporations uh, do not uh, uh, present themselves as representing the interests of the American people. Now, our big corporations and the bosses that uh, run those corporations represent their own interests. And it is not up to the United States government to protect them if they invest in foreign countries, especially in dictatorships. And uh, these companies have gone overseas. They put our own people out of work. They have bolstered the strength and the wealth creation that has been co-opted by crony capitalism in China and elsewhere. And we must make sure that the people of the world know that this does not reflect what the American people are all about. This reflects the special interest and of these particular businessmen who, by the way, are betraying their own working people here by investing in a way in China that, <laughs> that provides the click that runs China, the power, and then the corporate heads make some money, and the people who are losing, the people of China themselves who now are under an even more oppressive regime, and working people in the United States who are out of work. You have been advocating human rights a lot. Uh, so why do uh, China's human rights issue relate it to uh, the national interest of America? Human rights isn't always the top priority in some areas because you do have chaos and confusion going on uh, in some countries that are fighting radical Islam right now, for example, and there's been crackdowns and people are fighting and killing one another. You can't judge it only based at that moment on, on what the human rights are at that moment. But what is their long-term goal in those countries? Is it to build a, a freer society where people are free to worship God as they see fit? Is it to build a society in which is uh, more democratic and open and permitting people to criticize or to accept the government policies or to reject those policies? That is what, if they're building for that, even though there's a violation of human rights in the meantime, well, we can tr understand that during a chaotic thing. But in China, for example, uh, what you've got is a suppression, a major suppression of human rights in order to support a crony capitalist clique who have made their own deals with our own crony capitalists in the United States. 
And why is it in our interest not to permit that to happen? Why should we be permitting, be promoting human rights for all of the Chinese people rather than just those in the crony capitalist clique who are making deals with our crony capitalists? Because we know by, uh, and we can chart, that democratic societies are far less likely to try to create a conflict with other countries and to make outlandish demands on other countries than our dictatorships. And if you have a dictatorship like you do in China, uh, it is much more likely that, that those dictators will uh, make, uh, for example, territorial claims that, will, that might end up in a war. Or to do things, for example, like creating islands out in the middle of the, of this, of the uh, South China Sea out of, uh, out of reefs and then telling the world nobody can go in these territorial waters because this is now an island that's Chinese. Democratic societies are less likely to be that type of abusive and aggressive of uh, other countries and thus lead to war, which means that's in our interest. But at the same time, we know if they're doing that to us, what are they doing to their own people? If a Chinese dictatorship in Beijing is, is doing something that risks war with, with other countries and killing other people, we know they won't even think once about killing their own people. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that is in our interest to see that there be a more democratic group of people in charge of various countries. Uh, it's in our interest that way, but it's also the moral thing to do. And when you, I'm a believer in God, and when you do what's moral, I think things work out better. Coming up, what does Warbacker think of U.S.-China relations? Talking about uh, U.S. and China relations, it's probably the most important um, bilateral relations in this world in the decades ahead. So when you look at this relationship between these two countries, do you see it's, it's about trade and an e economy, uh, essentially, or is it about national security? And um, uh, I think that we have got to quit separating national security from economy. Because what we have done in the last uh, 30 years with China, and 40 years actually, uh, we have built an economy that, and an economic structure that created more and more and more wealth, but the wealth was then controlled by a tiny clique of people. And that's why you have China, all, uh, Chinese people from, their, from your government all over the world bribing other governments, buying up minerals and, and things such as this, while your own people are, are suffering and, and still living in abject poverty and don't have the health care and don't have the education and don't have the, the actual benefits of, of a modern society. So they, they do that because you've got a one a clique in, that, in your country running things. Well, we shouldn't be on the side of the clique. That we should be on the side of the regular people because it's less likely that ordinary people who are prosperous and living well will want to go to war and want to make outlandish uh, uh, demands of other countries. And we see that coming out of an arrogant, uh, in the same way the, the leadership in Beijing is arrogant to the Chinese people, they are arrogant to other countries as well. Hmm. I know you are being considered for the position of the Secretary of State, uh, along with some other gentlemen. So my question is, um, if you were to become the Secretary of State, what your outline of uh, you know, U.S.-China policy would look like? Well, the first thing is we will renegotiate uh, our contract and set down different sets of rules so that we don't have a situation where just small numbers of people in the United States and small numbers of people in China are benefiting by this great economic activity. I mean, there is so much exploitation going on of the Chinese people and also, I might add, a rejection of the interests of, of those American people who have worked for these uh, big corporations. So we've got to see that the economic rules of the game lead to a, to a situation where the ruling clique in China can't just siphon all that wealth, new wealth away for themselves. And so we should try to make it a more 
uh, an approach that is a more balanced approach uh, to trade. Number two, we have to make sure that the United States government does not shy away from suggesting that it is unacceptable for the United States to have the same kind of relationship with a country that persecutes its own people, that doesn't permit, China doesn't, look, you don't have opposition parties in China. You don't have free newspapers in China. You don't have radio stations who are critical. And when you do that, that means that you have an arrogance of power that is created among the Chinese. So our goal should be that to undercut a clique of arrogant rulers in China and try to make sure the Chinese people know that we are with them. Right. Um, talking about some specific issues in, of human rights in China, mm -hmm. you've been advocating the stop organ harvesting effort. So if you were to become the Secretary of State, what exactly will you do, what effort will you make to help to stop that? Well, as Secretary of State, uh, I would, uh, uh, one of the first things I, you could bet that I will be doing in terms of China is to make sure that we cut off any trade in organs that could in any way have been taken from prisoners or, or people involuntarily in China. There is easy ways to ensure. Now, if people of China, if someone wants to sell a, a kidney or if some, somebody's a family, someone in their family has died, in the United States we uh, get other people's organs when we've had traffic accidents and things. You know, we have to make sure that that the use of, 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 of someone's organs and that the God has given them is totally voluntary and is something that, that is uh, not being done uh, as a malicious, ugly act of theft or, or brutality against a prisoner. And uh, unfortunately, there are none of these safeguards in place in China today. They are, uh, there is no enforcement whatsoever of safeguards that will make sure that we know if someone is getting a kidney transplant, that that didn't come from a Falun Gong practitioner who was thrown into a jail and murdered exactly when that kidney was ordered from an American doctor. Well, we have to stop that, and that would certainly be high on my priority list. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to become the Secretary of State, what would be the biggest thing that you do differently from other candidates? Well, I think that if, as, if I was Secretary of State, uh, any type of uh, trip that I would have to Beijing, I would also make sure that I visited political prisoners and visited uh, the Falun Gong and other people who were struggling, uh, rather than just meet with the, uh, uh, with the business elite making their money or the political elite who are operating the repressive regime or even their military elite that are now engaged in uh, horrible uh, demands and, and militaristic type activity in the South China Sea. So, no, if, if I, our Secretary of State uh, and as Secretary should be more than that, and if I was Secretary of State, you could count on me going directly to the people of the country as well as an oppressive government. And if the government didn't want us to do that, I wouldn't go. Coming up, Rohrbacker thinks the world would be a different place if Ronald Reagan was president over the past few decades. You worked for President Reagan for seven years. You were his uh, speechwriter. So my question is, um, this time and Reagan's time, is there any similarities between our time and Reagan's time? And the second question is, uh, is there a possibility that you think the Donald Trump administration will resemble the Reagan administration and do the same thing for yeah. America? When I worked with Ronald Reagan, our primary uh, enemy in the world was the Soviet Union. And because of that, we had a certain level of cooperation with the Beijing government in order to bring down that great threat to the world peace, and, uh, which was communism in that controlled Russia at the time. And Reagan managed to do that without a major fight with a military, on our military and their military. And by the end of his administration, uh, the Soviet Union, the communist control over that, you are a large country, 
was evaporating. Well, he didn't do it, as I say, by armed conflict and attacking them with military. He did it with a across the board economic and, and as well as uh, political, as well as helping those people who were struggling against the dictatorship of, of the Communist Party in Russia. Well, uh, we almost did that in China, by the way. Reagan was also, of course, with his strong, forceful voice for freedom and democracy, he impacted China and the people of China. And they were uh, looking uh, to do what they, in China, what, what the people had done in Russia and got rid of the Communist Party. And it looked like we were going to succeed. And, and the people poured into Tiananmen Square. Unfortunately, Ronald Reagan was not president at that time. Had Ronald Reagan been president when Tiananmen Square happened, uh, the communist bosses would never have sent the troops in to slaughter the democracy movement in Tiananmen Square. And why? Not because Reagan said, we're going to attack you with the military. But Reagan would have picked up the phone to those gangsters in Beijing and, and told them, if you murder the democracy movement in Tiananmen Square, all the deals, the open markets, the transfers of wealth and, and the banking systems and, and all of the uh, investments that are being made are over. It's done. We're not going to build up a great strength in a country that murders its entire democracy movement, so don't do it. But you know what? Ronald Reagan wasn't president then, and Herbert Walker Bush was a far different president. And those of us who worked with Reagan understand that. So that phone call was never made. And so China remained under the heel of a Communist Party dictatorship that is nothing more than a bunch of a corrupt little gang of gangsters, crony capitalists who are lining their own pockets and are repressing the people of that country. Right. Um, you're mentioning of uh, the Tiananmen movement make me think of Falun Gong movement. You know, um, during this past two decades, America went through a few administrations, the Bush administration and the Obama administration. The Bush administration, I think, mentioned Falun Gong to the Chinese leader once. The Obama administration never did anything. So I was wondering um, if President Reagan was the president in those two decades, what would happen to the persecution of Falun Gong? Do you think the organ harvesting, forced organ harvesting will happen? Well, once the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had fallen, you can bet that the primary enemy and our primary goal in the world was no longer just bringing down that threat to the world. The control of the, by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was a threat to the entire world. They were financing communist movements everywhere, trying to overthrow democratic governments. Well, once that was over, uh, well, we would have, uh, uh, I think Ronald Reagan, had he been continued to be president, would have, uh, we would have had a, that would have shifted to Beijing, and it would have been a very short period of time because only shortly after that we had the great moment, a chance for democracy at Tiananmen Square. And uh, President Bush blew it because he didn't believe in those things like Ronald Reagan believed in them. He just thought being president was just doing his job daily and getting up and making the decisions of that day and making little deals with whoever he needs to make deals with and then going to bed at night. Ronald Reagan captured the vision of America and the vision of a greater world that filled with, with people who respected other people's rights, enterprise, stability and peace and democracy, not just Americans, but a, but a world like that, but not based on some United Nations or organized structure, but instead on the fact that the President of the United States, here again, leading the way talking to the people of the world, making sure that we are united together, not by structure, but by heart and soul. Right. So you think a situation will be different under President Reagan? Well, the persecution of Falun Gong. President Trump, if he wants me as his, uh, as his Secretary of State, will understand that I believe that we should not be intervening in other countries and trying to uh, occupy them and send military engagements everywhere. Uh, that type of intervention is wrong, but that we should be actively supporting 
at least letting them people know that we are encouraging people who hold our values uh, in these various countries to have reforms and and to make sure we vocalize that to the leaders of these uh, countries who are less than democratic or in fact who are gangsters and dictators. Right. Great. Um, Congressman Rohrbacher, do you have anything else to add? Let me just uh, say this. Uh, I, we are now coming to the Christmas season here, and uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, Christians throughout the world know that uh, uh, we Americans, although there are many Americans now have turned away from God, there are many of us who uh, really uh, hold these principles that Jesus taught us and caring about other human beings and returning love with, uh, you know, returning someone who hates you, returning love and trying to help those people yourself rather than setting up big government programs to help others, going out and trying to help people yourself. Uh, the Americans still have this spirit here and that ties us to people throughout the world who worship God and the Christians as well as uh, the non-Christians who are worshiping God in this season. So from one American Christian to all of you, uh, I hope you have a wonderful Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday. And let's make sure that especially with Don Trump as president, we make next year a really terrific new year for the world. When President Reagan was elected, the U.S. was amidst a global crisis and it was burdened at home with heavy debt, bureaucracy, high unemployment, and high inflation. Most importantly, the Americans were losing their characteristic optimism. The challenge Mr. Trump faces today is not entirely the same, but the loss of heart among Americans resemble what was happening during the Reagan era. America is at a crossroad which path it will take, and whether the U.S. can regain its faith that tomorrow is going to be better than today is a question posed not only to people like Dana Rorovacher, but to each and every one of us. Zooming in, we'll continue to report on the world after the 2016 U.S. election. Thank you for watching. See you next week.